onto the topic of the Human Rights Act. Uh, Brian asks, why is a Human Rights Act superior to common law? Won't such an act have to pass through years of judicial adversarial, ad adversarial argy-bargy before it is truly useful? Hmm. I concede there'll be adversarial argy-bargy. There always has to be with a new law of this sort. If we lived in some ideal world, I suppose we could say, well, yes, couldn't the common law keep going forever? Uh, but as Brian, was it? The, yes, yeah. Brian. Uh, but as Brian would obviously know, given the complexity of the question he's asked, the common law has been developed by judges over generations. And guess what? Not just Australian judges. It's been largely developed by judges in the United Kingdom and in other countries such as New Zealand and Canada to name those which are closest to us. And guess what? All of those jurisdictions now have a Human Rights Act. That then creates a particular problem because it means that the common law, if it's still being developed in those jurisdictions, it's being developed in conjunction with their Human Rights Act. Now, we being the one remaining jurisdiction without one, the risk is that the development of our common law becomes frozen or it doesn't become as duly responsive to the cross-fertilising that we would expect from judges having recourse to other jurisdictions. Think, for example, of anti-terrorism laws. Mm -hmm. Uh, a new issue comes up, September 11, you need anti-terrorism laws, every equivalent jurisdiction passes a law, they end up being challenged in the courts, comes to the House of Lords in the United Kingdom, what's their first port of call? How does this stack up against the Human Rights Act? In New Zealand, how does it stack up? How does this stack up against our Bill of Rights Act? Canada, how does this stack up against our Charter? Australia, oh, how does this stack up against the common law? Well, what is the common law now, and how does it develop? it probably gets frozen and fragmented, and that's the problem. Great. Um, there is actually one uh, question that I have here, and just let me locate it, uh, which asks about the idea of uh, reviewing uh, legislation in the context of the anti-terror laws. And uh, it's David's question, which <laughs> says, your inquiry and report have been encouraging. My most immediate question is, how could a new Human Rights Act correct existing legislation, and, and specifically refers to the anti-terror legislation that you had just mentioned? It's important to point out that, if I may say, I think one of the strengths of this report, as I was saying in today's address, is we've really put forward three tranches of reforms that could be made. Now, in the second tranche is the idea of an audit of all existing Commonwealth legislation and giving priority to a few key areas, including anti-terrorism laws. Now, that can be done whether or not you have a Human Rights Act, and it should be done immediately though it's a fairly resource-intensive exercise for government and, I dare say, a fairly painstaking one for legal officers in the Attorney-General's department. But even the federal opposition has proposed it. So, as far as I know, the only ones to be opposed to that at this stage are the Australian newspaper. But they're opposed to everything in this field, and I don't think they should be seen to speak for the Australian people. So, the effect, then, of a Human Rights Act on something like the anti-terrorism laws in the future would be that if such laws were being made in the future, there would be a process to go through where the bureaucrats in crafting the bill would have to provide a statement of compatibility to the Joint Committee on Human Rights of the Parliament. The Joint Committee of Human Rights of Parliament would then conduct an inquiry to assess compatibility. Presumably they'd hear from bodies like the Australian Human Rights Commission. They would then receive a report. That would then be received by both Houses of Parliament, including the Senate which presumably the government doesn't control, and that there would then be some robust debate, which might not otherwise occur, which in previous times, as has often been said by Senator Brandis, he would always assure us, well, such debates do occur, but they occur within the party room. Well, one thing about the party room is we don't get to see publicly, transparently, what and whether the correct compromises have been made, whereas if it's done through the parliamentary processes, it might be enhanced. Nathan uh, asks, Frank, do you think a Human Rights Act may give judges and magistrates too much power in their interpretations of it and by the case law system, too much power on these inherent rights? Is the United Nations or the International Court of Justice a better avenue to use to protect our rights on these grounds? Well, definitely the International Court of Justice is not appropriate because usually you've got to be a nation state to be a party to get there. There are various UN committee processes which can be used, and they have been used in the past in Australia, but they are not as transparent as judicial processes. 
Normally they don't, for example, have hearings where you have the right to counsel to appear. Uh, it's normally done on the papers and they're done in a more rarefied fashion where you have people from various countries who might not know much of the local circumstances. So I think there is a lot to be said for having these matters resolved locally and to have it done in the usual processes where people can be face to face in court or in the Australian Human Rights Commission where they're trying to effect a mediation or an outcome.